Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. I am your host, Renee Bauer, and I am here today with Helen No. She is a former stockbroker turned CEO and founder of her own investment management and financial planning firm. Her mission is to help women create more wealth for themselves, and Helen has unlocked the key to financial freedom that most people get wrong. I can't wait to find out what that is. Her insights have been featured internationally in well-known publications such as CNBC, Forbes, CBS Money, Investors, Business Daily, just to name a few. And in 2019, she was featured in Atlanta's Best Self Magazine as one of 10 women entrepreneurs who successfully built their business from the ground up. She is a sought after speaker at women's leadership conferences, universities, and Fortune 500 companies. Through her coaching program, she helps solo entrepreneurs overcome financial complacency to smash their money glass ceilings and reach their highest earning potential. So welcome. Thank you so much, Renee. I appreciate it. I feel like I'm about to get like an exclusive coaching session right now. So (laughs) I'm pumped. Um, What I really want to talk about is being a business owner. And I I have a lot of women in my circle who have some some side hustles that they want to become their full-time hustle. Um, They want to leave their day jobs and or they want to turn this passion that they have into profit and into a thriving business. Um, So I want to kind of talk about all of those things and being an entrepreneur and, you know, how to do something like that. Um, But why don't you first start with your journey? Because I know that you left a corporate job um, to follow what fills you up. And can you just share a little bit about uh, your background there? Sure. Yeah. Um, My background, I've I've been in the brokerage business or or the financial planning arena for 11 years now, but I did start out as a stockbroker. I thought it was so cool to be selling clients or talking about stocks and making money like that. That has always been my interest was in personal finance, was figuring out how do we get rich, right? How how do we make money? I mean, who doesn't want that? (laughs) You know, that, that truly, you, when, you know, in college, that's what I was trying to figure out. I was like, how how do I make money? I was so anxious to graduate in -hmm. order to start working. And, you know, looking back, I wish I had taken more time to, um, you know, travel a little bit more, but, but I I was just so anxious to, to work and figure it out all out on making money. I'm like, I'm ready to go make some money. I'm, I'm ready to get rid of this or finish my degree and and go out there, be a stockbroker. Um, but that type of framework or, or, you know, um, environment wasn't very fitting for me. Corporate America was just not for me. I didn't want somebody to tell me who I should be working with as clients um, you know, I was working with clients in, you know, I was working with, um, in this smaller practice, uh, in, 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 in the business where we were managing like $500 million, but only for rich people. They are already rich, yeah. you know? And then I was thinking like, well, what about people like me who was only making forty five, sixty thousand $60,000 at the time? How do I get rich? <laughs> How do I get to that level okay. of having $50 million? Right. Um, and so that's when I decided you know, and speaking about following a passion, it's not really, I followed my passion. I was trying to follow my purpose. My purpose at that time was to help other individuals like myself who was making less than six figures to get to six figures, right? So that's where I decided, you know what? People don't become rich by working for somebody else. People accumulate wealth faster by working for themselves because mm. at that time you, or in that role, I can like, my income's not the ceiling. I don't need to go to a boss and ask for a raise, which I did. And a guy got rejected. That was another reason I left corporate. I was like, why am I asking him for a raise? I want to give myself a raise. Yeah. And so that's really why I left corporate America. I didn't like the environment because one, it limited my income ceiling um, and two, I wanted the financial flexibility and also marketing flexibility to work with who I actually wanted to, which was individuals like myself to help them get to that next level. And we're going through that process together, right? So that's my journey in a nutshell. Um, and, and speaking about passion and purpose and, and your question earlier about, you know, how, how, you know, some people are having side hustles. I think you need to make a distinction between what passion is 
mm. versus what your purpose is. For me, I was chasing my purpose, but I was passionate about it. Because to me, passion is a feeling. It's not an activity. It's not, you know, it's, it's an emotion that drives me towards um, getting to my purpose and making sure that, you know, whatever my purpose is, to me, purpose just means what else do I have to give to the world? How, how else can I help individuals in the world, right? And I'm very passionate about that. So that's long story short. What, Do, don't you find that most entrepreneurs have this passion to really do something with their purpose? Like they're, they're, they're trying to, to serve, to change the world, to provide something to others. And they are typically really passionate about that. The passion drives it, but I think where the missing ledge in between is the mechanism in which you bridge the passion and the purpose together, right? So you might, everybody, when I ask you like, what, what, what do you want to do? I want to help people. That is like mm -hmm. the most common answer I get for your purpose. Like, what, what is your purpose? I want to help people. You want to help people, Renee, but in what capacity, right? Right. My capacity is when, when you think about entrepreneurship, you're selling a product, you're out there to make money. You, you don't have a business unless you're actually making money in the business, right? Otherwise it's just a hobby, right? Which is completely fine. But if you really want to drive change and help more people, you got to generate income, you got to generate revenue in the business. So how do you do that? What product or service is it that you are going to sell and put out to the world that's actually going to help that, that mm. person? Does that make sense? Th that does. So then what does someone do to, if they're in that, they're kind of in that gray spot where maybe they have something that they really love and they want to turn this into a business and they're excited about it and they think they're dreaming big. Like how do they, how do they take that purpose and really turn it into profit or into something that where they're, where they're in the driver driver's seat as to how much money they can make and you know, yeah. what their future looks like. Oh, so that's where the tactic side of things come in so purpose and passion and all of that is good but now you have to really ask yourself what am I selling what am I really selling right so Helen knows she sells financial planning services right so that's just a product to me that's just a service that I sell for an X amount of dollars for this consultation or you know a series of consultations or a coaching program that's just a product that I sell in order to achieve my purpose so really the end goal that you should be thinking about when you sit down is, what am I trying to sell? What, what, what is it? What is the tool that I'm going to provide for others that they will pay for, that they're willing to pay for in order to get what they want, which is X, whatever that mm -hmm. is, fill in the blank. And so how can you figure out if someone's willing to pay for something? <laughs> when you're, when you're, I mean, when you're early on in your business, you don't know, you're like hanging, hanging up the shingle, opening yeah. the bank account, you know, buying the laptop and yeah. like, then yeah. what? Um, one thing as a new business owner, if, if you're a new business owner, and this is why I work with solo entrepreneurs is you have to figure out your risk capacity of testing, right? As an entrepreneur, you have to throw ideas out there, whether it's a coaching program, let's just say that you are a, um, a, a career coach, for example, that's, you, you want to help people transition in their career from, you know, being a lawyer to being a yoga instructor. I've seen that before. <laughs> I've had clients. I, I can understand that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're like, Helen, I hate law. I just want to do yoga. I'm like, okay, do you want to do online yoga? How, how do you want to sell yoga? for example, mm -hmm. how do you make that transition? So if you're a career coach in that capacity, you have to figure out, do I want to sell one-on-one -on -one consulting to help this attorney become a, a yogi, a professional yogi and do trips all over the world? So, you know, that's, that, that's really comes down to that. You have to be willing to test out what your audience wants to actually purchase from you. And do you want to do it online? And you have to figure out your time capacity too, right? So do you want to do one-on-one? -on -one? Cause that takes a lot of time. If it's one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. then you got to sell it at a higher price point than you would say right. in a collective group typically. So yeah. you say that money is a science and that it's logical and data driven. What does that mean? <laughs> yes. Because I mean, I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners operate from heart, you know? 
<laughs> yes, and and I'm and I I have heart, but then I also am very logical too. So my background is in mathematics, so I, I naturally go to that. But again, a business is an entity; it's a machine that you have to keep fueled. So if you think about like a plant, right? The the only way that the plant will grow is water. So in your business, if your if your business is the plant and you want to try to to grow it from a seed to a giant oak tree that has big extended roots that's you know even if you chop it down it'll grow back you got to water it and how much water are you able to to gather you got to go out there do you, do you pick it up with a pail is there a more efficient way to get the water in the well and that water is money in your business right so again if you when, when you think about it a hobby versus like if you're really trying to make an impact in the quickest way and by volume of people you're trying to help, you have to generate money in, in your business. And in order to do that, you have to learn how to count the money, which is a science, which is the accounting piece of it, right? Mm -hmm. So you either do it yourself or you hire somebody else to do your books and tax planning and all that stuff. Um, and you have to figure out how you're going to bring the money in. That's the money making part, right? And that involves you spending some money, whether you hire a, a business attorney to make sure your contracts are proper, whether it's, you know, hiring a CPA and hiring staff and a team to help you. Um, all of that, you have to be able to have the skill set of knowing how to spend and invest the money. So all of that is a science in itself and it's logical. There, mm. there's, there's a piece of logic that goes into it. And you use that data, right? However much your revenue is coming in, your profit margins and all of that. And all of this sounds intimidating but you can hire somebody to do it for you <laughs> mm -hmm. is what I'm saying. Um, you know, and I think a lot of people are so scared of money only because they don't know how to read the numbers right. that can be learned. Yeah. I mean, and that's not, especially when you're starting out, that's not as intimidating as it sounds coming out of your mouth right now. <laughs> you know, yeah. when you, when you say it that way, because the numbers are smaller, you're not starting with uh, a, a huge uh, multi-million dollar business you're starting small and you're starting with small income and smaller expenses hopefully and so it does become manageable and you want as you kind of i think as you get your hands in it and you get a little dirty it starts to become very familiar yeah exactly so you you know as a business owner your job part of your job is to understand the numbers and at least read it and say oh you know i just launched this product for six months was it was it fruitful is it attracting the right type of audience that I want um, for, for my business? And so that's going back to what I said earlier, is you have to be willing to take the risk of testing out different products and services to see what actually sticks. Mm. You know, so. And sometimes you, you don't know, like you can take all the social media polls that you want or ask in private Facebook groups and you just don't know unless you do it. Exactly. Exactly. Same thing with like a freebie. I, I've done so many freebies. Yeah. Some of them do better than others. So yeah. yeah. I've had the same experience. I had one freebie that isn't really living anywhere. And I mentioned it in a, a Facebook group and I still get emails every week asking for it. I'm like, really? I'm like, that was the one that was the least amount of effort. And I put the least amount of thought yeah. into, and that's the one that people want. So go figure. Yeah. There you go. So same thing with products that people actually want to buy. I, I think about it the same way. Like you don't really know until, especially if you're starting from scratch, you don't really know until you, you put it out there, promote it and market it and see what people would actually click on and purchase. What are your thoughts on how long it takes for a business to become profitable from the point when it, when it starts? So when you say profitable, tell me what you think that means, Renee. Well, I think that it means you're earning, uh, you're covering your overhead and you're able to write yourself a check. So that is the misunderstanding right there. That ah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So that is profit. Profit means, so, so there's two pieces here. Making money in the business is one thing. Making a profit is a completely separate thing. So you're making money. So let's just say your business is generating $100,000 a year your expenses is $50,000, your profit is 50 grand, right? Your profit is what's left after you've already paid your overhead. So the number one thing you have to think about is, like, like for Amazon, for example, it took them 10 years before they were profitable, but the entire 10 years, they were making tons of money and every single year their revenue grew, 
but they didn't make any profit, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning that they didn't have any extra room at the end of the day to, you know, for, for anything else where they could reinvest or whatever. Um, so it, it really, so, so your question really is in order to make a profit, well, a company can go 10, 15, 20 years without becoming profitable, but in order to continue to exist, it has to continue to make money. It has to make money. So covering your overhead, you got to make money to cover your $50,000 a year executive assistant, for example. That's, that, that, you have to make money. That, that's not profit um, right. at all. And I think a lot of people get those two things confused. Is, and you see a lot of business coaches out there saying, oh, I want to scale. Let's, let me scale your business to become profitable. Well, pro you know, from a tax planning standpoint, now I'm getting technical. Um, <laughs> but you have to pay taxes on that profit. So right. some companies, they will, they don't want to make any profit because they're going to have to pay right. taxes on that profit. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that's, that's funny <laughs> because it is getting close to tax time. So <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So does that make sense? Like, yeah. So, but to answer your question really is how long does it take for me to, to make money, like generate revenue in order to cover my basic overhead? Hopefully that first year is you're, you're kicking mm -hmm. ass. Um, you know, it took me, so my first year in business, I only made $35,000 a year. Um, and then finally in year four was when we finally hit six figures and I, I started to get a good cadence and a good marketing mm -hmm. plan in place um, before I actually started to, to hit, you know, past 100, 150 to 250. Um, yeah. I mean, I, so I think the moral of that story is though, you, when you start it, you can't expect, or I, I think most people don't hit it out of the park right out of the gate. Like they are, you know, it takes time and you it took you four years. It certainly took my law firm, um, a number of years to, mm -hmm. to get to the point where it is now. Like it takes time and continuing to show up and being a little bit patient with it and understanding if you keep doing this thing, it will eventually turn into something else. But you, but um, I think a lot of people give up when it's not immediately, um, you know, this, this stellar offer or, or right. right. I, you know, I think people get discouraged when, well, for, first of all, a lot of people go into their business, not knowing how much money they actually want to make first of all, right? So if you want to do it full time, let's just say your, your personal expenses every single year, it costs you $50,000 just to, to live, right? So after you pay taxes and all that, generally you, you should be making between 60 and $70,000 in your business gross to cover your basic living expenses. So the first step in, in setting your financial goals for your business is, well, how much money am I really trying to make? People go into it blindly and they're like, oh, I'm not making any money, but well, what were you trying to hit to begin with? Yeah. And the answer usually is, I, I'm not really sure, just to, just to pay the bills. Okay, you paid the bills, but what about going above and beyond that? Where, where are you trying to take the business next? Hmm. So you're suggesting that someone who's thinking about starting a business needs to really think about the, the long game? For sure. 100%. Yeah. Is, is this, are you starting a business to replace your nine to five job? Because if it is, you've been making a hundred grand at your nine to five. Well, now you have to replace that income. Now you got to think you, you, you know, there's, it costs money to run a business. So how much, how much do you actually need to make gross in your business? And usually it's going to be a hundred more than a hundred thousand dollars if that was what you were making in corporate America, wherever you are now. Um, so definitely have to have a target goal of, in terms of revenue of how much you're trying to make. First. So do you suggest that someone continue to work their side hustle, do what they're doing and continue with their day job until they can safely transition earning the same amount of money? Or do they kind of throw caution to the wind and say, you know what, I'm just going to do this. <laughs> okay. If you want to do it my way, the way I <laughs> did it was I did not do that. Okay. I, I left my corporate job because I hated the environment so much. It was so toxic to my well-being yeah. that I quit cold turkey. I moved back in with my parents. I borrowed some money and I hustled. And I, I mean, you know, I even remember writing down in my, my journal of how painful my experience was in corporate America. That I was like, I, I always read it for the first two years as an entrepreneur to remind myself, do not go back, do not go back, do not go back. 
do whatever it takes to make money in your business and try to make the sell to not go back and, and remember why you left and remember why and who you're trying to serve, right? So that was my methodology. Now, if you wanna be more conservative, then yes, <laughs> then yes. So it, it really is a matter of risk tolerance of, um, of your approach to it. I have a very high risk tolerance. Um, so I, I didn't mind cutting out you know, half of my expenses, moving back in with my parents, that saved me $1,000 a month, right? So and going out and borrowing money, I mean, I had to pay that back eventually. Um, so, you know, th there's so many different ways to become quote unquote a full-time business owner. But I think a lot of people, you know, when, when the worst advice I hear is follow your passion, like passion, it, it doesn't, that, again, th that's just an emotion. It doesn't mean that you will actually make money from pursuing it. You really have to learn to run a business first. Yeah. That's your number one job. It's not to, you know, if you love selling pottery, um, well, learn, or you love doing pottery. The pot is just the product that you're selling. Learn how to sell the freaking pot, right? <laughs> to make money. <laughs> <laughs> you are dropping some major truth bombs over here. <laughs> so, I'm just saying it's, it's true. Like you want to be, you want to be a yoga instructor. You want to launch your yoga business and, I had a client who launched a yoga business and it quote unquote failed because she couldn't, she didn't know how to be a business owner. Yeah. Well, that happens a lot with lawyers too. They, they want to leave the big law firm and they open up their own practice. And a lot of them end up going back because it is so much more than just being a lawyer. There's so many, so many hats. I spend more time running the business than I do being a lawyer. But that's it, right? So you are selling legal, legal consulting is, the product that you're trying that, that you're selling running the business is a job in it of itself oh, yeah. by a CEO. That's all they do is make executive decisions all day long. Yeah. They, they're not the technician. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, I think what it really takes is you becoming passionate about running a business. Yeah as well along with it. That's what I love doing. I mean, I love the bit running the business. I love like testing the marketing and you know, like that stuff excites me. <laughs> me, too. me too. I'm like, man, that was a big mistake. Oh, let me try yeah. the baby. Oh, that flopped. Well, let me try something else. Uh-huh. So, so yeah. Like the risk tolerance things that you have to figure out. And I, one of my favorite questions I like to ask my business clients is what is your favorite failure? Hmm. What is your favorite failure? What, which one of your products or whatever it is, what, which one of them was your favorite failure that, that taught you the most? Um, and you have to be willing to fail so many times and get rejected yeah. so many times. Um, you know, how I built my business, Renee, I cold called and I went door to door. Mm -hmm. And it desensitized me. Like, I, I just was like, oh, great. They said no. Great. So yeah. what? You move on. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you fail forward. You just keep moving and you don't look back. And I think that that's probably one of the common mistakes people have is when they, when they run up against that first wall, they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, okay. You know what? Now I'm, I'm, maybe this isn't for me. And it's like, no, you keep going. You, you, no matter what you do to get on the other side of that wall, you just have to keep moving forward. Because I think that's part of the entrepreneurial journey is that there's right. going to be a ton of failures. It's impossible to not fail and be a Correct. business owner. Yeah, I, th I think you just have to accept the fact that failure is part of the process and success is not. Success is yeah. the destination of your failures, right? Yeah. Um, th that's the way I look at it at least. I'm like, how many times do I need to fail to succeed? How yeah. many times do I need to get rejected by a prospective client or you know, whoever comes in and how many no's will it take for them to get to a yes? Mm -hmm. So to me, success has always been a destination, not part of the journey necessarily yeah. so I, uh, I want to fail i want to fail well yeah because that means you, you're still you're moving there's that's momentum <laughs> you're not stuck that's, that's awesome true. yeah and so i think you know if you are wanting to follow your passion or your and make your purpose a reality you have you just have to accept the fact that or be willing to test things out and it not working mm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so let's um, let's spend the last few minutes talking about money and marriage and relationships. Yeah. Um, so, uh, can you speak a little bit about that? Have you had any experience with um, how money has impacted a woman's role with money when they're in a relationship? There's a lot of listeners who are um, divorced or going through the divorce process, and money is always like a, a, a really big. Um, spot where they're stuck or they're afraid or overwhelmed. So can you speak a little bit on, on that? Yeah, I, I have two spectrums of clients. I have one set of clients where the woman is the primary breadwinner and she is the primary CFO. So whoever reaches out to me, if it's the female or, or, or the wife, the spouse, um, I, can, I, I automatically know usually 90% of the time sure that she's the one who's making all the executive decisions, right? Um, now, if it's the husband reaching out, I'm also 98% accurate that his spouse or wife is taking a back seat. Interesting. On the decision making, right? So he might be the one who is, um, you know, well, let me take a step back real quick. So, so in these consultations that I have with clients, I always try to make sure to ask the same question towards the wife and the husband or, or to, to both spouses. You know, for example, tell me what your one to two, one to three year financial goal is. And if the husband steps up, I mean, I, I really pay attention to the conversation dynamics of who goes first and jumps in on that money conversation because usually I can tell whether or not they're the primary decision maker of it. Sometimes the husband is the primary breadwinner, and then the wife is the one who dictates and controls where the funds actually go. And I call her the COO, the chief operating officer of the household. She has all the passwords. She knows where the money is. And then the husband is the one who's more strategic about it, right? So to me, that's a really healthy relationship because you have both people who are jointly in that decision-making process, but also jointly in that tactical decision making process too they have the roles delegated right now the one the relationships where it's very toxic and i'm more um not coddling of, of the, the spouse who doesn't make any of the financial decisions because i have seen where the wife is a primary breadwinner but also controls the financial decisions and the husband doesn't know mm. what is going on with the money either right so that's not healthy um, and then you start seeing a power struggle. Now with my divorce clients, they're usually female. They say, I'm looking for a different financial planner because my husband kept my old financial planner. Mm -hmm. Very typical of, of female divorcees coming to us. And she doesn't understand how the 401k works. She has, she didn't earn any money, but now her primary earning is the alimony. Like it gets very complicated and really helping her get to that place of financial literacy of making these decisions and being confident that she's making the right financial decisions on how to spend and invest her money. And that is a huge challenge that, that I deal with working with those types of clients. Hmm. Is there anything that, so if you have someone who's kind of in the back seat, um, how do, where do they start? Like, how do they start really stepping into their ownership or control of their own money story? Yeah, usually if, if they're working with us, I usually contact that person and, and pull them into, you know, making a phone call to them instead of calling the husband first in order to talk to her. I will call her and say, Hey, um, by the way, your husband's account is at XYZ balance. Um, I want to invest it this way. And she, and then she would like, Oh, why don't you call John? I'm just making up names now. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't need to talk to John. I want to know mm. like, what, what do you, what do you want to do? Because this is a joint investment account. What do you want to do with this money? Interesting. And then, and then she starts opening up. So it's really forcing her to have the conversation with me instead of allowing her to continue to defer to her spouse. Oh, that's so fascinating. So you're doing so much more than just the investing in the planning. I mean, there is. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I, I want, you know, statistically men will die before a woman, right? So I know like to my husband and I, he's probably going to die before me. Um, so I want to be in control of the money. I want to know where all the money is, you yeah. know, and I have these conversations with him is, oh, you want to buy another investment property? Well, shit, you better get another life insurance because I'm, I'm selling that thing if you die. 
I'm going to invest it in my own portfolios. <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to have to deal with your mess when you are gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so he, uh, we're, we're, we have these types of financial conversations and, um, you know, I, in my own personal experience, you know, the only joint account we have is the, um, our joint investment account where, you know, we took our wedding money and put it in there. Um, the one thing that I would encourage couples to do is that actually get on the same page of financial goals, not necessarily that you have to have the same checking account or the joint blah, blah, blah. Like that's not managing your money together. Managing your money together starts from the very top of, we agree on sending our son to private school and spending $25,000 a year over the next 10 years. That's a joint financial goal. And if you can get to that place, then all the money conversations become easier, right? Then you can delegate, Hey, um, Mrs. Client, you're going to, you're going to, you know, be the primary person talking to Helen as a financial planner to make sure we get to that $25,000 a year tuition. And he's the one who makes the money. Fine. It doesn't matter. So do you think that women should have their own, their own stuff, their own accounts, their own? Personally? Yes, I do. 100%. 100%. I mean, the statistics of divorce are so high. <laughs> um, you know, and, yeah. and, and really, but in a marriage, I guess it really depends on which state you're in too, um, of whether or not that's truly yours at the end of the day. Well, you know, and, and especially for even like second marriages or third yeah. marriages, like I, I know when I was going into the marriage with my current husband, like we previously had former lives, you know? So when you came together, there was this part that was like kind of holding on and you're like, oh, wait a second. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to combine everything at this point. Like, you know, I've been through a divorce before. And so we're yeah. going to just keep things, you know, it took us a, a few years to really integrate and have those conversations because you almost had like this, this wall up. He's like, I have a pension. I'm like, well, I have stuff, <laughs> and, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, you, you know, it took, it took some work. Um, it's definitely, I think an important conversation for couples to have probably before you get married. Oh, 100%. You should yeah. know. And I, I'm all for, you know, so we do a lot of premarital financial planning too, mm. or financial consulting is, you know, having a prenuptial agreement, is not just for the rich guy marrying yeah. Barbie. That's not, that's not so true. You know, mm -hmm. like I have a prenuptial agreement to protect yeah. my earning potential. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I encourage having those pieces in place to protect yourself as, as an individual. So true. Helen, you just, we talked about so much. Um, I, I, it's, it was all so good, so fascinating. And, um, it was awesome. How do people connect with you, work with you? Um, are You are on the East Coast, but you can work with anyone, right? That's right. We're 100% okay. virtual. Um, you can find me at HelenNo.com. Um, so yeah, just, just go on there and, and check it out. All right. Awesome. And I'll put all of the show links in there too. So one final question. What is your definition of financial freedom? Oh my gosh. <laughs> It changes every time. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. Right now, financial freedom is being able to have enough money where I don't have to second guess if I should buy something or that I can afford something. Right. So if I want to spend drop twenty thousand dollars to buy my entire family a nice luxury vacation and I don't blink an eye, to me that's freedom. Oh, amazing. And I think the point is that there's an evolution and it can evolve. 100%. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Ellen. Thank you.